This is the clinical diagnostics category, and we're going to kick this off. And the first way we're going to do this is have our um, have our uh, right uh, our, sorry, our best in class companies introduce themselves. So in no particular order, and and the firing at you, I'm going to start off with uh, Joseph Mossel from Ibex. Hi, thank you. So I'm Joseph Mossel, CEO and co-founder of uh, IBEX. Uh, we develop AI applications and digital pathology. Our mission is to make sure that every cancer patient uh, receives the right diagnosis, that they get it quickly, and that it's relevant for selecting the right course of uh, treatment for them. And the way we do it is by uh, developing a product, a set of tools that pathologists use while diagnosing cancer. We have today already products for prostate cancer, breast cancer, and gastric cancer. And what I'd say really sets us apart is uh, first for how long we've been doing this. Our first clinical product has been deployed already clinically in 2018. Uh, and today we have over a hundred labs using our products uh, in labs around the world. Thank you. Brilliant, fantastic. And well on the time well done. All right, next up uh, is Brian McGuire from Herex. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian McGuire. I'm Senior Vice President for Herex Group. We are a global company based in South Africa, and we our mission is for healthy hearing for everyone everywhere. Uh, so we, we do this by uh, using digital technologies to be able to reach people in certainly underdeveloped areas of the world and also uh, in markets like the United States as well. Uh, hearing health plays an incredibly important role in the um, long-term health of a person beyond being able to hear better. This has been proven through many uh, studies that it directly correlates to dementia, social isolation, depression, and many other areas. Uh, so the product that we're going to talk about today is one that can help us understand and diagnose that and be able to do that anywhere without a clinical setting necessary and be able to diagnose and help treat hearing loss long-term. Fantastic. And Brian, it's, it's always surprised me when I, um, in this particular category, when I've uh, talked with, with uh, 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 especially friends of mine like Charlotte Yeh, who's the medical director of the AARP, you know, when I said, oh, what's the biggest problem for, for healthcare for, for, for seniors and she said it's hearing loss and you think that would be like number 27 on the list but no it's it's obviously a huge huge Absolutely. issue so yeah it's been underappreciated i think within the hearing uh, or in the healthcare landscape and the effect that it can have on overall broader health and now that's just coming to light in the last couple of years fantastic all right next up is darius shahida from butterfly Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Darius Shahida, and I'm the Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer at Butterfly Network. Um, I've been with the company for the last six years. Um, and at Butterfly, what we've done is we've created the world's lowest cost and first portable whole body ultrasound, which we call the Butterfly IQ+. Plus. This device, uh, which I'm holding in my hand, you, you can't really see it because of the background, um, is the first of its kind semiconductor powered technology. And it took our team almost 10 years and nearly half a billion dollars to create. While the device itself is predicated on semiconductor technology, we've really empowered it with novel artificial intelligence and an intuitive software user interface that finally makes ultrasound accessible and easy to, to use. Um, since launching Butterfly IQ Plus about three years ago, We've sold over 100,000 devices, making Butterfly the number one selling medical imaging device on earth. Um, our technology is not only being used in some of the most sophisticated health systems in this country, but also by midwives in some of the most resource limited settings in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's because our mission really is to democratize medical imaging and ultimately replace the stethoscope. So I look forward to speaking more with you about it today. Okay, fantastic. Introductions to uh, three of our four. We are missing HeartFlow. Unfortunately, it was a board meeting and we couldn't get anyone from HeartFlow on the uh, on the webinar this morning. As you might guess, they are a, a diagnostic company that, work, that, that works in the area of, of cardiology. Um, I won't try to pretend to um, introduce them any further than that. But with that, I'm going to introduce Paul. So Paul uh, Paul Grant is, a, is a, the category champion here, which means he's the guy who knows about uh, med tech and clinical diagnostics. So uh, Paul, why don't you say a word about yourself, uh, a word about your thing, the, your your sort of state of the market, and then uh, dive into some questions. 
All right. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Paul Grand. I'm the CEO of MedTech Innovator. Uh, MedTech Innovator is the largest healthcare accelerator in the world. Um, and specifically, we have a particular emphasis on devices, diagnostics, digital health, and life science tools that we call bio tools. Um, so that's our focus. We've seen probably more than any of these uh, in the world than anybody else. Uh, like 10,000 companies have applied to MedTech Innovator. We've accelerated 600 of them. So we get to see quite a bit um, of the new technology and clinical diagnostics are one of our, um, our most favorite areas because they can make a real impact on the care pathway. So um, I'm going to focus my questions today around that. Um, and for these innovators that are in market and have been serving patients um, for a while, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the things that you guys have achieved so that um, our judges, as they're choosing the final winners um, from you incredible finalists can make an informed decision. So I, I think where I'm gonna focus in on are really two questions. Um, and I'm gonna start with the, I'll start with the first one, so not to confuse you too much. Um, but the first question is really to focus in on, you know, what um, what data your diagnostic solution provides, you know, in particular, um, and how your your solution is actionably impacting the care pathway today, um, and uh, and then we can kind of also follow that, and you can continue in the same answer with how you see it evolving over the next. And in, let's say over the next five years, an impact in the care pathway. So how are you actionably impacting the care pathway today? And how do you see that evolving over the next five years? And if you can keep the answer relatively short, we'll get to ask you more questions. So, uh, so let's start with that. Um, and, uh, and why don't we begin with, uh, with, with IVAX? So Brian. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the, the way we have, uh impact on uh, on diagnosis is actually uh, just making sure that patients get the right diagnosis. So we provide a tool uh, for pathologists that they use while doing the diagnosis. And the first time, as I mentioned before, the first time this tool was deployed in 2018 uh, in a lab in Israel. And within a week, we saw the value there because the, the tool caught, uh, our algorithm caught a case of prostate cancer, which was missed by the pathologist. And this allowed them to revise the case and make sure the patient is on the right diagnosis. And that, so that was the first time that we know that the initial diagnosis of cancer was, was by an algorithm. Uh, but since then, that has become something which happens on a day-to-day -day basis, that pathologists are using our tools and reaching the right diagnosis. And obviously, uh, without if somebody who has cancer is diagnosed as benign, then they're not going to be on the, the right uh, treatment path. Uh, so for me, this is something which is going to become part of, let's say, the five-year vision is based on what we see in labs and how frequently they make mistakes. Uh, this tool is absolutely essential. And typically, uh, everyone who tries it, they, they feel the same and, and they want to deploy it. So, so one part of the vision is simply much wider usage of, of these kind of tools, specifically ours. Um, and the other part of the vision, so... One part is really helping do pathologists what they're supposed to do better. The other part is, can we answer questions which pathologists aren't able to ask with their bare eyes and provide insights uh, onto how, how to select the right course of treatment? And that will continue to evolve also over the next years. Okay. And, and I think I saw um, something you had uh, posted somewhere saying that 100% of your customers would recommend or would purchase the solution again? I think you guys had a study like that. Is that correct? Yeah, we had uh, there's uh, we had a class report done uh, where they actually they 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 went out. We gave them a, a list of our customers. They went and uh, interviewed them. We don't know even exactly who 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 they interviewed, uh, but yeah, we were blown away by the the results we got. Kind of almost an A uh, result, which is uh, typically unheard of in class reports. And yeah, very. A lot of excitement from our existing customer base and that that was great for us great terrific thank you very much um we'll come back for more questions let's go on to uh to herex so uh so brian same question for you how are you actionably impacting the care pathway today and how do you see that evolving great thanks paul our product is called Hear Test, and as you might imagine, this is for hearing tests. Any the, the, one of the beauties of our product is that anyone can do it. Actually, 
while it can be done in a clinical setting, we intended it to be done um, that really anyone with some training uh, is able to administer this uh, diagnostic test. The data that we capture to answer that question is very specifically audiometric data. It is a um, audiometer. And the biggest difference between our approach and traditional approach is this can be done essentially anywhere, anytime. A, a tablet and a pair of headphones can give you the output and the results. Typically, this is required you know, a, an entire truck of hearing booths coming in or a very physical setting to conduct this activity. And that's really what's changed. How it's impacting the uh, care landscape in the next few years is what we do is uh, through that simple pure tone audiometry test, that data is uploaded to the cloud that can be viewed by anyone, anywhere, anytime with the rights to that information. Uh, and we, what we do is we actually monitor from your baseline tests to uh, annual or periodic tests. Uh, for example, during a, uh, a drug trial or something like that, uh, your exposure to hearing loss, whether that's be because of noise-induced hearing loss or ototoxicity that's in induced as a result of a drug trial or something of that nature, that information can be shared with the participants there to one, immediately alert them to something. So it results in better drugs and better pharmaceuticals for people um, globally. And it also can result in a better workplace. As you know, under OSHA, people are required to take those tests uh, to ensure that their hearing doesn't uh, evolve over time. So it increases productivity by the, um, by the employers and healthy employees. Yeah, and I, I'm curious, you mentioned uh, in your opening about this being for underdeveloped as well as developed markets. So is that something that you've seen success in, in the underdeveloped markets as well as developed? Yeah, definitely. Our screener is actually used uh, by the WHO um, as uh, one of the screeners that is used uh, globally and really trying to assess and uh, do regular hearing checks uh, internationally. Um, we've had millions of tests conducted worldwide, and uh, we are seeing, seeing success there. Terrific. Um, that's really great. And, and I know you've got your Lexi hearing aids, and you've got other products as well, too. So all these things all go together to give you a complete solution, right? Yeah, exactly. We haven't covered that today, but we do have a whole separate side of the business, which is um, over-the-counter hearing aids, which we've gotten into over the last year. So we can not only diagnose and understand hearing loss, but also aid in the prevention of that. Um, obviously, getting help for your hearing does help reduce, um, as I mentioned in the opening, uh, social isolation, dementia, depression, the, all these longer term uh, health problems, but it also helps you hear better. So, I mean, that's probably the most immediate benefit that people have. Yeah, I, I didn't mention, Brian, I went to a heavy metal concert last night, first one in about 10 years, so I uh, can't quite catch what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's a residual uh, wolf mother, if you must know, was the name of the band. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's move on <laughs> with that to uh to butterfly. Um, so so let's cover this too. So um, so Darius, you know, same question for you again. Actionable, actionable changes in the care pathway and how you see that evolving over the next several years. Sure. Um, so I mean, one of the biggest conundrums about ultrasound as an imaging modality is that. It's broadly applicable. About two thirds of diagnostic dilemmas can actually be solved or addressed using simple medical imaging. And yet when you think about the access problem that exists, two thirds of the world's population has no access to simple medical imaging. And so you know, one of the reasons why that is, there is, is actually there are three primary reasons why that is, I should say. The first is cost, the second is access, and then the third is ease of use or education and training. And one of the things we've done at Butterfly is we've really architected our solution with those three barriers to broader ultrasound adoption utilization in mind. Uh, we, we achieved and addressed the cost issue by introducing this novel semiconductor enabled technology, which really is the first digital innovation in ultrasound in the last 50 plus years. We addressed the access issue by really democratizing this and making this technology available in over a hundred countries simultaneously. We did that by launching on e-commerce, which for medical device companies, a fairly novel go-to-market strategy, but also in working with a network of about 300 NGO NGOs globally um, to really get this technology to some of the lowest resource uh, settings on earth. And then last but not least, regarding the biggest problem, which is really ease of use, education and training, we've worked not only with um, 
partners like the Gates Foundation, where we just trained a thousand midwives in sub-Saharan Africa, the largest deployment of ultrasound ever. Um, but also we've leveraged cutting edge breakthrough technology with artificial intelligence to really help automate the guidance and interpretation for a number of novel applications. Uh, just earlier this year, we received FDA clearance for our Beeline counter, which is a very useful tool for the management and treatment of pneumonia and congestive heart failure. We also previously launched a, a bladder volume tool leveraging AI, which gives you the volume of the bladder. And the third tool I would just mention, which, which is having a, a very real impact, um, which is not yet commercially available, but we've developed it with the Gates Foundation uh, and our partners at UNC is this novel gestational age tool where a midwife or a lesser trained practitioner can do three simple sweeps of the abdomen and get the gestational age of a fetus. And so as you think about our strategy to continue to innovate and introduce novel AI applications to help um, really empower this ultrasound solution, we are gonna to continue to bring to market technologies that automate the interpretation of a, a lot of exams that would otherwise require a lot of training and education. And that really helps um, change the statistics that I mentioned earlier around access um, uh, to this life-saving technology. Great, Darius. Well, congrats on selling 100,000 devices. That's uh, over 100,000 devices. That's really impressive. Um, and as you said, being the number one imaging device in use is uh, is a pretty amazing statement. Um, just quickly, um, I, I want to move on to kind of like a second question that I'm going to give all three of you, and, and uh, I'll work backwards. I'll start with you, uh, Darius, since uh, since we'll keep, we'll keep going on this topic. Um, but this um, idea of being in the market for a while and 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 seeing all sorts of things, you know, I'm sure there's there's something perhaps that was surprising or something that um, you know you weren't expecting that you know you, in your original deployments of just putting this ultrasound device in everyone's hands, um, and and that perhaps you know informed you and in how you changed your direction or how you've maybe leaned in. So it could be something maybe just an it could be something inspiring, something that you saw and you're like, wow, that's incredible, and we're going to lean into that. Um, any anything you can share from you know this this wealth of uh, experience you've had clinically? Sure, I, I think the biggest lesson um, is is a, a broader lesson just around disruptive technology adoption, um, and we we experienced it very vividly and and poignantly in our early years of commercialization. You know, when you launch a novel technology like Butterfly, um, initially the the market reaction is one of euphoria, there was almost a viral adoption behind this technology and device. And that really came from the innovative early adopters who recognized how powerful and disruptive this technology really was. But in order to really achieve behavior change and to cross the chasm and really move the market, you really need to understand the ecosystem in which you're operating and what the biggest barriers to entry are. And you know the the lesson we've learned on this journey is that that last barrier to entry that I shared on on my prior answer, which was really the ease of use, uh, training and education, is by far the biggest hurdle or barrier to ubiquitous ultrasound adoption. There's no reason why clinically we should listen when we can actually see. Right when you think about using a stethoscope to do something um, in a, you know, just a primary care checkup, for example, it's a very crude technology. And uh, by all measures and means, ultrasound as an imaging modality is superior, right? But only in so far as that practitioner actually understands what he or she is looking at and is able to actually capture the right image and interpret that image. So as we think about the ways that we can overcome that barrier, our strategy has really evolved such that we're taking an almost an omni-channel um, approach. We are working to innovate on the AI side and the software side by bringing in applications, which, as I said, automate interpretation and guidance of many of these um, really clinically relevant scans and, and workflows. But at the same time, we're investing heavily in education and training so that we can empower the, the next generation of physicians with a butterfly or, or an ultrasound uh, as they go and embark on their educational training and journey. And the last thing I'll just say to that end is we have a number of medical schools across this country and abroad 
where um, they're actually giving a butterfly device to every one of their incoming medical students at the white coat ceremony so that they can actually embark on their medical journey with this device and tool in hand. Awesome. I love it. All right. Let's move on to uh, to uh, Brian next over at, at Herex again, you know, something something, you know, maybe again, anecdotal, inspirational and, and, and as quick as possible, because I want to make sure we can get to everybody. So thank you, Brian. Yeah, in terms of in terms of the learning that I, I think we've seen is just an amazing adoption by more companies wanting to understand their employee health. I'll use it, occupational health as an example. What's prevented them from doing this in the past is the enormous burden it put on the organization itself. They have to run a hearing conservation program. It's a lot of work. They have to check on each employee. There's a ton of paperwork. All that's essentially eliminated. Anyone within that organization uh, through our system and solution can run that hearing diagnostic test. Those tests are automatically um, sent to the cloud. They manage that data centrally. They don't have to be at multiple facilities or multiple locations in order to do that. And they can you know, rest assured that their employees are actually working in a safe environment, that their hearing is not uh, deteriorating over time, and they're not going to be left with uh, potentially lawsuits or anything larger on that nature. Most importantly, it's because uh, they want to have a healthy hearing population within their workforce. Uh, so that's one example where we've seen really, really great results and it broader adoption in industry. Terrific. Thanks, Brian. And then lastly, Joseph Ibex. Yeah. So I kind of think I'm going to echo a bit the journey Darius mentioned of kind of these early learnings and then as you mature you, you you different kind of learnings and the early learning really was kind of the realization how frequently cancer is misdiagnosed I think this is something that was known to some extent but there weren't any large-scale studies on that and once we started deploying our technology we, we started to see that and labs which are really good then maybe they misdiagnose two to three percent of the cases and consider that that's not so good if you consider it, but we've seen numbers going up to 25% and labs which I'll describe them as not so good. So th th that was kind of when we started seeing the these numbers, this was kind of an aha moment about how, how valuable the technology is. Um, but then as, as you go and you start to commercialize it, you, you think, okay, this is obvious. Everyone should be using it. This is a no brainer. And you start to learn more and more and there's barriers to entry. And there's a few of them, but I'll, I'll mention one. And that's, uh, I like to paraphrase uh, Napoleon. Napoleon said that amateurs uh, study strategy, professionals study logistics, and healthcare, it's, uh, let's say, uh, healthcare AI. So uh, amateurs study uh, algorithms, professionals study integrations. And that's uh, something very clear from our customers. They, you can come with the most amazing algorithm, but if they can't integrate it into their existing workflow, it becomes very difficult for them to use it. Uh, and the way we approach that challenge is by, by partnering, by partnering with other companies in this ecosystem, companies like, like Roche, Philips, and others, to bring to market not only the best algorithm, but also a tightly integrated solutions customers can actually deploy. And I'll end with that. It's a great, great way to paraphrase paraphrase uh, Napoleon. Um, nice, nice job. Uh, but, but great job for all of you. Really exciting solutions, and great to see how you guys are are really making an impact on the market. So terrific work. Fantastic. Um, so that's the uh, that's the end of our uh, uh, best in class. Uh, we missed Heartflow, but the camera's off for you, gents, please, and camera's on, please, for everybody from the rising stars category we're going to go straight to these and we're now you have eight of you in a group so this is uh this is this has to be quicker and piffier we let those old established companies waffle on for a bit but uh <laughs> we're going to expect piffiness so to start with this we're just going to go around i'm going to read, read it down a list i'm just going to say the company name introduce yourself introduce your uh uh product and you have 30 seconds to do the uh to the elevator pitch all right and i'm going to start uh because uh it's on the first on my list with uh inook uh, hi, I'm uh, Kaushal Solanki, founder and CEO at INAC. Uh, INAC is a global AI company that's that's developed one of the first autonomous uh, disease detection system focused on detection of uh, uh, vision threatening diabetic retinopathy. Uh, with uh, you know anyone with diabetes is vulnerable to blindness that progresses without any symptoms. 
and it's a leading cause of blindness in working age adults. People are not getting screening due to lack of access. And with our first and only fully autonomous AI, that's FDA cleared for detection of both referable and vision threatening diabetic retinopathy. Uh, we are making a huge impact. Some of the largest body of clinical evidence with studies on over 100,000 patients with regulatory approvals globally with use in 20 countries in five continents. We are on our way to achieving our mission to screen every eye in the world to eliminate preventable blindness. Great, great calls there, Kosal. All right, sticking with the uh, whole retina and eye thing, um, Optina. Hi, thank you. Hey, we finally cracked the code on Alzheimer uh, therapeutics. So I know I prove and, and covered by CMS. So Optina is the only test that can support early access to those therapy by providing their family care physician with biological information about your brain, irrespective of symptoms. Uh, Tina I test received breakthrough device designation, and it's about to get regulatory clearance. Uh, we work with BCG on market perspective, and provider said that would 75% of providers said they would uh, uh, adopt Optina for all their cognitively impaired patients. That's over 30 million people. So we're really on the verge of a most important medical revolution of our time in Alzheimer's disease, and Optina is leading the way. Fantastic. Yeah, huge, huge problem. A very innovative solution to that. Next up, Mark Edwards, that view mine. Hi there. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, ViewMind is a clinical diagnostic tool for measuring brain health. The technology is based on eye movement responses to visual stimuli performed using a VR headset. Uh, it's based on 20 years of fundamental research, and, and we use AI. It's a, a quick non-invasive test. It takes about 10 minutes. A, the, the, um, the diagnosis uh, that are currently used in common practice, such as CSF, MRI, PET, they're expensive and invasive. And cognitive tests uh, doing behavioral analysis lack accuracy. New digital solutions are urgently needed to also understand the functional changes that are going on in the brain uh, for these diseases affecting a billion lives a year. And uh, ViewMind's differentiation is really in terms of precision, is ultra high sensitivity and specificity, precision that can impact the success rates for pharma drug development, precision to improve precision patient um, care, and aid the treatment for decision uh, treatment decision making, and and finally, ViewMind delivers brain health insight. Fantastic! All right, next up is uh, Adam Grable from Journey Bioscience. Hi. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, Journey Bioscience is a digital health company. Uh, we provide predictive clinical screenings and expert lab analysis, uh, empowering health systems and professionals to shift the future of care. Our first product on our Compass platform is called NaviDKD. Uh, it predicts diabetes-related kidney disease up to 12 years in advance of uh, clinical signs and symptoms, paving the way for early interventions that can delay or prevent progression to diagnosed uh, kidney disease. Fantastic. Um, next up, uh, and we've been doing, going down all the different types of diagnosis. Next up, thank God we finally have an, uh, somebody without a Y chromosome. <laughs> Tracy Warren from uh, Astarte Medical. At least I knew who was coming next. Um, hi, everyone. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Astarte Medical. Um, we are a clinical decision support and ultimately a clinical diagnostic focused on nutrition, probably the most modifiable risk factor in healthcare. We've developed Nutrition IQ, which is an EMR integrated platform focused on driving initially standardization of care as it relates to clinical nutrition, particularly in vulnerable populations with a focus in pediatrics. So our first product is called Nick Nutrition. We sell it to support feeding uh, and growth and development for preterm infants. And our goal is really to empower clinical teams who don't get a lot of nutrition tr training in medical school um, to have greater confidence and reduce the burnout and the burden associated with delivering optimal nutrition, which has an impact on not just uh, inpatient outcomes, but long-term health outcomes. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I've been looking at some nutrition solutions, and that one for the NICU was really quite wonderful. Um, Robin Bodu from CyberLiver. Hi, I'm Ravan Bodu, co-founder and the chief operating officer of CyberLiver. CyberLiver is a platform offers solutions to manage various indications of liver disease. Today, liver complications are identified through clinical assessment that requires patient to be present 
giving an accuracy of 70% at the best. These complications, uh, complications are often identified too late, resulting in frequent admissions. So our AI-driven platform captures essential digital biomarkers through the app-connected sensors and patient input remotely to predict the liver complications with the accuracy rate of over 95% enabling liver, enabling early intervention, thus avoiding um, uh, hospital admissions. The current system costs US insurance companies over 30 billion just for hospitalization alone, with the liver disease rates expected to increase by 40% in the next 15 years and projected 35% shortage of hepatologists by 2035. We foresee a global crisis and and we are actively working to bridge the gap. We filed six patents. We are first mover to address the liver disease. We are granted US FDA breakthrough and UK CA class VA. Brilliant. Okay, two more to go. Uh, John Neil Kenny from Flosonics. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm John Neil Kenny. I'm a co founder and chief medical officer of Flosonics. My background uh, is pulmonary and critical care medicine. Uh, at Flowsonics, we've developed the Flow Patch. It's the world's first uh, wireless wearable uh, point of care Doppler ultrasound system. I'm holding it here. Um, there's uh, tons of applications uh, for this device from determining return of spontaneous circulation and CPR, detecting crypto blood loss and hemorrhage. But what we're really focusing right now is on uh, intravenous fluid resuscitation and sepsis. It's uh, Sepsis Awareness Month in September. Um, you know, uh, over 1.5 million uh, sepsis cases a year in the United States alone. Uh, and what the device really helps us do and, and um, uh, helps particularly emergency room physicians and intensivists give intravenous fluids to patients who are septic. So typically what's done now is patients get fluids based on heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and doing that is a bit like uh, driving around at night in a new city with one of your headlights knocked out and an eye patch over one eye. You can do it, uh, but it's probably not the safest way, and you're probably going to run into some things and create some complications. So if you actually uh, give fluids based on flow, uh, which comes from our device, uh, it's, it's kind of like uh, taking off that eye patch and getting that, that extra headlight and, uh, and uh, getting a better sense. And there's good uh, association randomized control studies showing that when you give fluids and sepsis based on flow, uh, patients do better. Thanks. Yeah, fantastic. I, I didn't realize it was a problem, but now, now I'm next time I'm in the hospital getting a flu IV, I want, a, want one of those things slapped on my neck. So I'm <laughs> getting it right. <laughs> fantastic. Okay. And last but not least, uh, Jason uh, Prestiaro from Particle. And Jason, you may not know this, but you're one of five companies that you, uh, founded by a former health group. I know uh, employee or intern, and uh, three of whom are finalists in this sort of year's award. So well done, me. Ha! Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Very amazing. Well, uh, hello to everybody. Jason Prestonario, CEO of uh, Particle Health. Uh, Particle Health is a data interoperability platform that's really um, allowing us to, to, uh, to, to, to take advantage of the power of 300 plus million identified medical records um, kind of across the country. So our mission is to unlock the power of medical records in an intelligent platform that focuses health back on the patient. You know, too often um, in any type of, of provider setting, uh, the providers don't have enough of an understanding of what that patient's, um, you know, care has been, where they're coming from, that longitudinal patient history is missing. And so we're really focused on ensuring that we can pull that through um, leveraging anti-information blocking and TEFCA frameworks and pull that through and allow providers to have much more of an insight and understanding into that patient's history, their conditions, so that we can provide better point of care um, and pull that all the way through to ensure we're getting the right treatments to the right patients at the right time. Brilliant. Okay, so part of a little different than everyone else in this group because it's uh, more of a data information play. But yes, obviously a big part of uh, of a diagnos diagnosis is knowing what the hell actually happened before. All right, uh, Paul, take it away. But just uh, to, to give everyone a heads up, there's a lot of you in this section and we don't have a lot of time yet. So we're going for that pithy 30 second answer rather than the three minute ramble. <laughs> All right, Paul, take it away. Yeah, as, as, as be as brief as we can, everyone in your answers, we definitely want to get through everybody, maybe even two questions if we have time, but if we don't make this the really good one. So I'm going to start off with, with a, with a really important question. So we, we heard from the, the clinical companies that are already in the market and have been around for a while, the larger companies, you guys are the rising stars. 
Um, so I don't expect you to have as much uh, traction in the market and much uh, as much perhaps as they do. I know some of you do, um, but I want you to use this opportunity to give us something inspiring that you've learned along the way. Something again, perhaps that you saw in some of your early studies. Some things that you you know you've recognized again that it you know maybe it's that aha moment that says like wow we're going to be successful and what that is. So just let's go through each of you in the same order that we started off with again. Uh, I'm going to start off with I. Nook. So, you know, again, I know you got a huge opportunity, 100,000 patients, you said so far. So tell us something inspiring in there that you go like, oh, my God, this is we could tell this is going to be a game changer. What was that? Yeah. So uh, we, we we worked on uh, creating an autonomous AI system. So a system that does not need a specialist to uh, do any diagnosis. Uh, it's like self-driving car. And one of the first, uh, you know, we have done several clinical studies to support this, that it can be operated by anybody, anybody with high school diploma, and the goal is to improve the access. And, and, and what we ended up achieving is even better. We increase the access by enabling anybody to screen patients for diabetic retinopathy and now a AMD and glaucoma as well, but also with much better accuracy then even an ophthalmologist, board certified ophthalmologist conducting dilated eye exam on a patient. And this was shown in a prospective multi-center clinical trial. And, and, and this, is, this is also where things are moving, much better access, much higher accuracy, much less expensive, and leading this category of retinal diagnostics to become um, the the standard of care in diagnosis of multiple diseases. Um, so, yeah. All right. That's, for, that's terrific. Let's move on to Optina. So, uh, so David, you know, tell us what you're doing in Alzheimer's. Any, any particular insights from early work that you can share? We've been running 22 clinical sites uh, around the globe as we uh, collect our clinical data for our FDA clearance. And, uh, you know, as, as these trials come to an end, we have to remove the equipment and send it to another site so we get more data and, and we have a tough time. Everyone wants to keep uh, access to Optina's uh -huh. test. And uh, we just uh, did a large uh, adoption work with uh, contacting a provider through the U.S. and and the uh, potential adoption for the technology is very very high. We see a very high demand for for being able to tell patient what what's the cause of their cognitive impairment. It's 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 something to tell them that they have some Im impairment, but what is the cause and how they can get to treatment. And that's that's what we're we're seeing in our uh, clinical trials. That's great, David. Um, we're going to keep going here with ViewMind, and I want to remind everybody too: if if your aha moment can like can revolve around that care provider who you know is probably needed in this pathway, um, that would be great too. You know, not just a patient experience, but also like, oh, we had a care provider, and this is what they they experienced, and they told us that and give us feedback. So I love people not returning tests. That's fantastic. Um, they don't want to give it back. Let's keep going with ViewMind. Yeah. Hi. Um, so. One of the key things that we found is that because we have such incredibly high sensitivity and specificity, we're able to detect the very earliest changes in, in certain neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. We're also able to measure incremental change, very small changes. So, for example, if somebody's taking a, a drug, a treatment for a particular condition, we're able to actually measure the impact of that treatment in a short time frame. And we've, we've done work in with uh, over 20 hospitals in uh, in multiple sclerosis drugs, in depression, depression drugs, and we're also working in the area of Alzheimer's as well. We're actually about to, we, we have a study we've done with the Mayo Clinic as well in cardiovascular, and we can even detect the very sensitive changes due to certain cardiovascular procedures. Fantastic. Um, that, that's really great. That validation is super important. So congratulations on that. Let's move on to uh, Journey uh, and Adam. So, uh, you know, you said 12 years Picking up kidney disease twelve years before before diagnosis that's amazing. So give us some uh, you know some you know examples specific examples of, of how you're changing care. Yeah. So thank you. So I think uh, one of the I think aha moments for us is if we um, my co-founder is a um, was a practicing endocrinologist so he and a physician scientist so ultimately our product was really born out of uh, solving his own problems. 
But I think as we look at this and really the importance of uh, addressing really the standard of care today is really about diagnosing existing kidney disease and injury. Uh, with our predictive technology, we're able to look 12 years in front, so that time and really that clinical runway that it creates for clinicians to deploy interventions that will delay or prevent progression uh, is really, really important. And for us, uh, kind of the inflection point of where we started to say, how can we change really the diabetes industry and how diabetes is cared for uh, was really just uh, unlocking um, uh, really how that time can be best utilized in terms of early into diagnosis uh, and ultimately how do you kind of work with patients and intensify interventions and in, that fit into existing workflows. All right. Very good. Um, let's move on. Thanks, Adam. Uh, go to Astarte Medical, Tracy. And again, you said something in your intro about this being the most modifiable behavior in care, eating, which uh, which I was thinking about. And you're right. Uh, and certainly it is, right? That's very modifiable. Sleep and all these other things are harder to get people to change. But but eating should be modifiable. So maybe you could tell us you know, how you are doing that. Some just examples of, of what you've seen so far. And obviously the NICU is the most precious place we can be treating people. So, you know, any examples, anything that a care provider looked up and said, oh my gosh, like in the, you know, that you've experienced so far. So anything you can share. Yeah, thanks, Paul. No, I do think, you know, it is the most modifiable risk factor. It's also very rarely taught for much of medical school. And so there's a mismatch in knowledge and confidence as opposed to some of the intensivists that we work with in the, you know, in the ICU settings and whether that be NICU or even adult ICU. Nutrition has a huge impact on outcomes. And while in hospital is in fact in the control of that clinical team. So the reality is though they're intensivists, um, they like to survive people and, and babies, that long-term vision of nutrition is often a blind spot. And so that's really what our technology is trying to fill the gap is to make it easy, to make it you know, predictable and standardized and to help people really engage because for our patients, that means shorter time in the, in the hospital, fewer readmissions. And it really does help to empower those teams to do better with, again, probably the most fundamental medicine we have, which is nutrition. For sure. And, you know, we've had a chance to work with a lot of pediatric innovators and, uh, and we've seen how incredibly impactful it can be if you can intervene at that stage. So, you know, this is exciting stuff. Thank you, uh, Tracy. We'll move on to Cyber Liver, Ravon. Uh, so, you know, I was listening to you talk about, you know, how your app is going to predict liver disease instead of having people do all these other tests. So maybe again, you know, anything you can share uh, in terms of, you know, how a particular, you know, care provider other than somebody on the team, perhaps, you know, is, you know, is either using the technology or has used this. And, and again, you know, and how they're, they're thinking this is going to change the way they care for the disease. Sure, yeah. So uh, we have done a pilot study at uh, University College London, which has, uh, which has given a tremendous result. We, the data showed 38% reduction in hospital uh, readmissions and about 63% reduction in uh, length of stay in the hospital. Um, I think the, the aha moment from the study point of view is when, we, when the study was completed, we asked the devices to, uh, we asked the patient to return the devices, and that's when we realized uh, listening to the patients, how effective it was. And one of the patients said, you are taking away our life. You know, that's how it was uh, when we, when they saw the improvement in the quality of the life. So we presented the data to Department of Health in the UK, um, who saw potential to save billions of dollars for NHS and, uh, and the patient's lives. And we are awarded uh, 4.5 million grant. Now um, we're deploying the system across 20 hospitals. Very good. That's really fantastic. Um, great, great traction so far, and great to hear that reaction there. It's hard to it's hard to get their attention, so that's great. Um, let's move on to Flowsonics. Good to see you again, John and Neil. Um, so, uh, so again, you know, you talked about you know uh, giving giving flu to patients uh, certainly makes sepsis a lot better. And if you have a you have the flow patch on, you know, you're going to be able to see a big change. I know you guys have been doing uh, you know a bunch of publications and, and other work and really demonstrating this. So again, what can you share about some things beyond beyond yourself and beyond your team that other people have observed and and how it's it's how it's changing their care that that aha moment. 
Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think um, the, the one of the stories that really sticks out for me was was shared to me by one of our clinical specialists at a site in California. Our, our device was used on a patient with a terminal malignancy uh, who had developed sepsis, and the patient was in hospice and was a do not resuscitate, do not intubate patient. So um, in a patient like that, if you are overzealous with intravenous fluids, you can very easily put them into pulmonary edema. And when you're a do not intubate, that, that's the end of the game. Um, and so uh, our device was used and all of the nurses involved in that patient's care were in, in, incredibly enthusiastic um, about the ability to give the patient just the right amount of fluids. The device told them basically when to stop um, and the patient uh, didn't get overloaded patient went from the ED to a step down unit and was um, discharged home um, in short order. Uh, and so, you know, for anyone on the call with a, a loved one uh, with a terminal malignancy um, knows that those, those last days and weeks are really precious and, and especially when they're at home. And so um, for me personally, uh, you know, that our device was able to, to, to get that for that one patient was, was very meaningful to me. Yeah, incredibly meaningful. Saving a life uh, makes a huge difference every time. So congratulations on that. Um, all right, let's move on to particle health. Jason, same question for you. So, you know, again, you know, your maybe your story might be a little bit harder. I don't know, because you're an API platform and, you know, all those things. But but any particular examples you can give us again, how how, you know, I mean, I, by the way, I love I love on your website. You guys see you, you intend to uh, unofficially destroy the fax machine. That's one of the favorite things uh, that, that I've read on a website in a while in healthcare. I would love to destroy yeah. the fax. But let's tell, you know, talk again, you know, whatever you can share with us again about about how this particular platform, people are going, wow, this is going to really change our care. What, what can you share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually will we'll go back to something that um, a previous uh, panelist, Joseph, said right around uh, amateur study algorithms and, and professional study integrations. And, and the reason I bring that up, right, is because I think in order to to talk about how you're going to care for a patient, um, and, and think about all of these incredible ways in which, uh, you know, AI and machine learning are really going to advance the ability to parse through a tremendous amount of information to really pull out and say, this is exactly the thing that you need to see. Um, you know, I think in order to do that, you need to actually have, right, uh, the algorithm piece is, is not the hard piece, right? The hard piece, the, the piece that you need first and foremost is the data, uh, right, which is all about the integrations across all of these sources of information about a patient. So, right, we really sort of see it as if we can bring forth that information and be that platform where all of these different types of interesting and important and innovative, um, you know, uh, algorithms can be built on top of, then we're in a position where you are elucidating, right, to that provider who only has a very unfortunate but true, right, small limited amount of time to think about how they need to care for that patient, you're able to bring forth and present to them exactly the information they need in that moment. And so being able to do that, right, brings us into another, um, you know, what we really see as, as sort of that next phase of, of clinical decision support and, and pulling through, right, sort of that care for that, that patient and ensuring that they are progressing through their treatment journey as efficiently and effectively as possible. Terrific. All right. Thank you, Jason. Um, I think uh, that, that gives us all the time we had. Guys, you did a terrific job. Love these solutions. Uh, you guys are the rising stars amongst thousands of companies that are out there. So congratulations to uh, all you've achieved. Looking forward to see who the winner is. Test is a certified air conduction pure tone tablet based audiometry solution consisting of an innovative mobile health application and calibrated headphones to determine clinically valid patient hearing threshold levels. The HearTest device is a portable audiometer that supports extended high frequencies up to 16,000 Hz for advanced monitoring of ototoxicity and noise induced hearing loss. Setting up your device is easy with the built-in setup wizard. 
This allows you to link your hear test license and headphones to the device as well as to set up a tester profile. Once the device is set up, you are able to start a test by selecting the relevant facility and patient. Before the test commences, a noise check can be performed. This provides you with a graphic representation of the ambient noise as monitored by the device in real time. This is also monitored throughout the test to ensure that the environmental noise does not pose a concern. Step-by-step -step instructions are available in an audio presentation of seven languages. Hello, my name is Stuart Shand. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at uh, IBEX. IBEX is a company that provides an AI-based solution to support pathologists in the detection of cancer. The prevalence and the complexity of cancer is something that is increasing, meaning that there's more and more cancer cases that need to be diagnosed at a time when there are less pathologists really putting the pathology industry uh, under strain. The solution that IBEX brings is able to bring improved efficiency, improved productivity, as well as being able to bring improved diagnosis. And together, uh, this means that we can reduce, uh, if not eliminate, uh, misdiagnosis within cancer. And we're able to do this at a time while we work together with pathologists uh, to be able to be uh, doing this more quickly and with an improved turnaround time. When I think about the superpower that IBEX has, I think we actually have two. The first is that we're developed by pathologists for pathologists. This means that all of the features and functionalities that pathologists uh, are used to working with and expect as part of their diagnostic process is part of the uh, solution. And it's also the pathologists themselves who are contributing towards those features um, by helping as part of the development process. So it's really a product for the pathologists uh, designed, um, designed by them. And the second, I think, is the fact that the system goes above and beyond the simple detection of cancer. The classification and the description of uh, cancer is far more difficult than just cancer yes or no. And the IBEX solution is able to detect and bring to the attention of the pathologist many, many different features, including measurements, different clinical features, percentages, all packaged together to make their life much more simple and to provide more standardized reports. I think that IBEX should uh, win the award because we're doing something so incredible and that is that we're saving patients' lives every day. Hi, I'm Charlie Taylor, founder and chief scientific officer at HeartFlow. HeartFlow has developed a novel software-enabled clinical service to aid in the diagnosis and management of heart disease, the leading killer. Over 700 hospitals in the U.S. send cardiac CT data to HeartFlow's AI applications running in Amazon Web Services, where we apply best-in-class deep learning algorithms followed by human inspection and correction to extract coronary artery anatomy data. We then simulate blood flow in the coronary arteries and provide information to physicians to enable them to determine if coronary artery atherosclerosis, the primary cause of heart attacks, is limiting the blood supply to the muscle of the heart, and if so, how it should be treated. Our flows products have been proven to have the highest diagnostic accuracy for detecting significant coronary artery disease and as a result, find patients with significant disease missed by other tests and reduce subsequent invasive diagnostic testing. The heart flow analysis that has been applied to more than 200,000 patients to date is supported by more than 500 peer-reviewed medical journal papers and is covered by Medicare and nearly all commercial payers. In 2021, the heart flow analysis was included in the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association chest pain guidelines. A recent clinical trial examining data from over 90,000 patients before and then after heart flow became available in England showed that the use of heart flow reduced the rate of all cause mortality by 14% over two years. Heart flow is the only company providing non invasive data on coronary artery anatomy, blood flow, and atherosclerosis to help physicians diagnose and manage heart disease, the leading cause of death in the United States. Thank you for your attention at HeartFlow. Our mission is to defeat heart disease. What makes Butterfly special is 
they actually put ultrasound on a chip. They're the first company to be able to commercialize that. And why is that significant? So all other ultrasounds on the planet actually use something called piezoelectric crystals. And the size and the shape of those crystals create the ultrasound beam that's then used to image the body. It requires different probes uh, to create different frequencies and different shapes to scan different parts of the body. By putting it on an ultrasound chip, we were able to scan the entire body with a single probe. We could create linear phase and curved array probes with a full range of frequencies. So instead of having a big cart and multiple probes, you had a single probe that would fit into your pocket that would connect to a smartphone. Now, and we're able then to leverage words, the trillion dollars of an industry to be able to sell this device for $2,000. So instead of a fifty, hundred, or $200,000 ultrasound machine, carts lining up the wall, you now had a ultrasound system in your pocket that you could pull out. And for the first time ever, ultrasound became personal. And when you start to think about the power of imaging information and how it can transform care decisions, I saw the value proposition of what Butterfly could become. And whether you're from the most advanced health system in the world to the most remote regions of the globe, this device changes care. If you can use your phone, you can use a Butterfly. We have a secure cloud that allows image sharing across the globe. You know, we're up on the space station now. You know, we're, we're in the remote regions. We're in more than, you know, a whole host of professional sports franchises on the sidelines. It's an amazing, the reaches, and it just transforms the way you think about the globe. It gets much smaller when you start impacting all these different people in different ways. And then I think the most exciting part of it is where we're going with artificial intelligence tools. I mean, what an incredible field. We're now developing tools that will take a novice user to guide them to get a good image and help doctors interpret those images. And we're developing pathways so that patients themselves can scan themselves in the home to monitor chronic conditions and stay away from the emergency room in the hospitals. Here at Astarte Medical, we believe that nutrition is medicine. We've developed Nick Nutrition, an EMR integrated platform that helps support feeding and nutrition for our most vulnerable and tiniest patients, that being preterm infants. Our solution helps to improve their growth and development to support our providers and give them time back in their day and address burnout. We drive standardization in care, which helps to reduce length of stay and lower healthcare costs. Most importantly, our solution can be scalable across clinical nutrition to support the vulnerabilities of patients using a modifiable risk factor being nutrition. We consider our superpower here to be that of grit and tenacity. We had our product launch aborted thanks to the pandemic, but have recovered well and are providing solutions to hundreds of patients improving their long-term outcomes. Our grit has gotten us through fundraising for a pediatric health IT company, an area that many consider too small or too niche to matter. And our grit has gotten us through growth stages, uh, challenges with hospital sales cycles, and we're very proud that we took on such an important and difficult problem to make such an impact. So when you ask me why we should win, we should win because we're unique. We didn't go and become the 10th company that does X. We forged our own path using data and analytics to drive better healthcare decision making, to support providers, help patients, and to lower the cost of care. And we do it with a passion and resilience that is unmatched by many of your applicants. We look forward to having a chance to share our vision and our story with you. I'm Ravan Bodu from Cyber Liver. Did you know that liver disease affects a staggering 100 million Americans and costs our healthcare system over 20 billion just in hospitalization? The existing approach is reactive and unfortunately often too late. I want to introduce you to Cyber Liver, where we are turning the tide by shifting from reactive to proactive healthcare. We have developed an AI powered digital medicine platform that diagnoses, treats, monitors, and manages liver disease proactively. Patients use our simple app connected to vital sensors to capture essential health data. Our technology is like a guardian angel for your liver. 
After capturing essential health data, our unique algorithms go to work, swiftly analyzing digital biomarkers to identify early signs of complications. This invaluable data is subsequently transformed into actionable insights, enabling clinicians to make timely interventions. Our studies have showed a reduction of 38% in hospital admissions, 30% improved efficiency for the providers, and much improved quality of life for the patients. The FDA has recognized our groundbreaking technology for its ability to predict liver complications and to deliver personalized patient care, giving us the designation of breakthrough device. On top of that, UK MHRA has validated our safety and efficacy with the UKCA Class 2A certification. So why should we win this award? Because cyber liver is poised to make an enormous impact on patients, on the healthcare system, and on the society. We are leading the charge as the first in digital medicine to specifically tackle the pressing challenges of liver disease. Winning this award will be a catalyst that will accelerate our groundbreaking journey. Hi, I am Kaushal Solanki, founder and CEO at INAC. Our solution is the IART AI system that provides fully autonomous point of scare screening for diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and glucomatous optic nerve damage in a single office visit during a patient's regular exam. The IART system has a FDA clearance and Health Canada license for autonomous detection of diabetic retinopathy, and it has a European uh, MDR uh, CE marking uh, for detection of all three diseases, including diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and glucomatous optic nerve damage. It is used by providers in 18 countries across five continents to screen, screen patients for eye diseases that blind tens of thousands of people every year. Our superpower is both the ease of use of IART, uh, being able to be operated by anyone with a high school diploma, as well as its amazing accuracy. Because it can be operated by non clinicians IART exponentially expands access to disease detection. That's key because these diseases progress without symptoms, yet with early detection, effective treatments exist that can reduce the risk of blindness. Unfortunately, patients face multiple barriers to getting screened. In many locations, there are too few ophthalmologists to care for everyone and there is lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, of these conditions, again, because they progress without any symptoms um, and lack of coordination, especially in low resource settings. I mentioned IART's accuracy. Peer reviewed studies have found that IART's AI is as much as three times more sensitive at detecting uh, diabetic retinopathy than even board certified ophthalmologists conducting dilated ophthalmoscopy. I'm uh, Dr. John Emil Kenny. I'm a co-founder and chief medical officer of Flowsonics Medical, and um, I'm here representing the Flow Patch. And this was a, an idea that was born from a common problem that would be seen in the hospital all the time, and that was patients just getting intravenous fluids uh, without objective measures guiding the provision of those fluids and they would get overloaded. They would end up on the ventilator, they end up needing dialysis. And it's super common that patients um, are getting IV fluids and they're actually not uh, responding the way that you think that they are. And I, that number is as high as 50%. Um, and so one way to address that is through ultrasound. And I was a big point of care ultrasound user and I'd use it in the hospital often to make management decisions for my patients, but it was really cumbersome. So the idea for Flow, Flow Sonics is that it's a wireless wearable Doppler ultrasound system. Um, and its superpower is that it's a completely new way of looking at the heart, um, looking at a peripheral vein and, and artery and using that as a completely new perspective on resuscitation and, and the direction the heart is moving is something that's never been done before. Um, and it's, uh, it's really worthy of this award, uh, in my biased opinion. The reason that that we, I think we should win is is all the problems that the team at Flowsonics have solved: the engineering, software, hardware, um, the clinical uh, translation of the of the product. Um, everyone who I work with who support this uh, project, uh, they're really the reason that uh, I think that we should win. 
What physicians really want to know is the specific pieces of information that are important to them at the point of care. And that's ultimately why we developed our FOCUS products. FOCUS stands for Filtered Outputs Curated for Usability and Simplicity. You can think about this as a condition or disease specific lens that is placed on top of the aggregated longitudinal patient record to call out specific pieces of information that are most likely to be useful at that time. So what we essentially did is we take our different data sources and aggregate them together into one longitudinal patient record. We then deduplicate that information and we set a lens on top of it that essentially sorts through these different buckets of information like ICD-10 codes, LOINC codes for labs, RX norm codes and CPT codes, and then surfaces the condition specific data across the specialty. What this really means is that Particle is able to return a wide breadth of data, but then also show the depth of that data in a specific area area to the clinician at the point of care. One of our CKD partners was able to reduce hospital readmissions by 41.5% and led to a total med medical cost reduction of about 13%. These numbers are huge, especially for our customers in the value-based care space. And what this shows is that you are able to drive um, end patient outcomes by having access to their most up-to-date and comprehensive data. And once you have access to this data, what we uh, want to work with our customers on is building the insights that they need. So for all their different uh, workflows, whether that's tracking metrics, um, getting better line of sight into predictive values for their customers or patients, you can use the data that you get from these queries to be able to build these insights that are custom to your patient population and your organization's needs. That allows this source of data to grow with you as a company um, and to increase the amount of opportunities that you can provide for your patients. I am David Lapointe. I'm the CEO at Optina Diagnostic. For patients and their family, the road to an Alzheimer's diagnosis is filled with uncertainties and frustration. S symptoms often go unnoticed or are attributed to normal aging process. By the time the disease manifests itself, irreversible damage has occurred, limiting the treatment option and diminishing the quality of life. The prevailing approach relies on late stage, symptom-based diagnosis, which failed to capture the subtotal early change in the brain. By the time symptoms become apparent, precious time has been lost, hindering the effectiveness of intervention and limiting the potential for meaningful outcome. Now imagine a breakthrough technology that empowers us to detect the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease, paving the way for timely intervention and improved outcome. Going from a symptoms-based late-stage diagnostic that is performed by a neurologist to an early-stage diagnosis performed by a primary care physician, saving precious time and resources. By harnessing the power of the retina, Optina technology enables us to capture data-rich, high-quality image that reveals subtotal change occurring in the early stage of Alzheimer's disease, going from a symptoms-based diagnostic to an objective uh, diagnostic. Optina retinal deep phenotyping platform not only provides early and accurate diagnosis, but it empowers patients and their family with knowledge and a sense of control. By identifying the disease at the earlier stage, we can implement personalized treatment and support system, preserving precious memory and enhancing the quality of life. Our pivotal study are well underway, and Roman targets have been met, and regulatory milestones are within sight. With each step forward, we come closer to a future where Alzheimer's is no longer a sentence, but a condition that can be managed with compassion and effectiveness. My name is Mark Edwards. I'm the CEO and co-founder of ViewMind. ViewMind Atlas is a precision digital cognitive biomarker that is able to on-demand access and measure the preservation and health of 19 regions of the brain and 16 cognitive domains. In terms of how the technology works, we expose the eye to a visual stimulus. This sends a signal down the optic nerve to the back of the brain, the visual cortex, and this then engages different areas of the brain depending on the stage of the exercise. Ultimately, this manifests in the form of eye movements, fixations, zacades, and the size of the pupil. 
We gather and digitize information about eye movements using a VR headset. It, the data is uploaded to the cloud. It's analyzed by ViewMind's intelligent algorithms and a report is generated for a clinician to be able to make a medical diagnosis. Traditional cognitive tests look at behavioral response. Does the patient get the answer correct or incorrect? The resulting scale is fairly coarse and above a cutoff, everybody's considered to be healthy. In the case of ViewMind, we're able to quant quantify with precision the health of different areas of the brain. And even with patients who are cognitively healthy, ViewMind Atlas can identify preclinical cognitive impairment. We're drawing from over a million times more data than a behavioral test, which gives vastly higher sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity not only to measure cognition with high precision, but to correlate with biomarkers, neuroimaging, EEG, and motor function assessment, yet non-invasively and affordably for millions of people. ViewMind is delivering uh, for pharmaceutical companies precision drug development and for healthcare, precision patient care. Your support can be meaningful in accelerating the access of this technology to millions of people. I give you ViewMind Precision Neurology. Hi, I'm Adam Graybill, CEO of Journey Biosciences. Our mission is to create technologies that predict and overcome preventable diseases, starting with the $28 billion problem of kidney disease within the diabetes population. Managing diabetes is a relentless grind. This complex disease demands constant attention and poses the risk of devastating complications. One of the most prevalent complications is chronic kidney disease that impacts one in three people with diabetes. Standard screenings only detect current kidney function or the presence of damage, leaving patients and healthcare providers in a reactive position. That's why we've developed NaviDKD, our novel predictive screening tool. NaviDKD identifies at-risk individuals before signs and symptoms occur by analyzing specific biomarkers in the blood that are scientifically proven to predict kidney disease. By providing the earliest possible detection, NaviDKD empowers clinicians to intervene early, ultimately delaying or preventing a CKD diagnosis. With improved patient outcomes, more personalized care, and reduced healthcare costs, NaviDKD is transforming the approach to kidney disease and diabetes. NaviDKD is not just an idea, it's backed by rigorous scientific research. With four clinical studies under our belt, NaviDKD has proven its ability to reliably predict the onset of kidney disease in people with diabetes. We believe NaviDKD has the potential to create a massive shift in diabetes care. It opens the door to prevention and has the power to extend and enhance the quality of life for millions of people living with diabetes. And this is only the beginning of our journey. To learn more about us and about NaviDKD, visit us at journeybio.life. Thank you.